And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Come, the mad, the madman behind Elf Lair Games the creator of the Orcs and the Ogres systems, respectively, along with things like Night Shift, Spellcraft and Swordsplay, and Chutzpah, a certain je ne sais quoi. Now coming to us with Wasted Lands, The Dreaming Age, the one and only Jason Vey. How you doing today, man? Good, thanks for having me on. Thank you for, com thank you for coming on. So... A bit of a tradition around here is starting with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, I mean, I think it stuck just because I was so young. I, I started playing AD&D in 1979, uh, the year it came out. I was I was five years old. And my uncle and his high school friends played in my grandma's basement, which is so ter stereotypical, but it's it's actually true. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to go sit down there with them, and they would tell me when to roll dice and point out with these funny little knobs, this piece of paper that I was given, and uh, I was hooked from there. Um, honestly, D and D, uh, Star Wars, and Conan the Barbarian kind of shaped my entire youth. So, given you mentioned Conan, obviously everybody brings up the movie, but I'd like to, I'd like to throw a bit of a curveball, as it were, and ask: Were you, at any point, did you end up reading the old Marvel comics? I never read the comics. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the old. Mar I mean, until much later, and I'm not a huge fan of the old Marvel comics. I'm. I tend to be a Robert E. Howard purist. I've read the original stories by Robert E. Howard more times than I can count. Uh, my introduction to Conan was the old Ace paperback series uh, that was Howard Stories with the uh, L. Sprague de Camp and Lynn Carter and Bjorn Nyberg mm -hmm. works. Um, my dad gave them to me when I was uh, a kid to read, and I tore through them. And then, of course, years later, I discovered the actual, like, unedited Robert E. Howard pure versions, and I just fell in love with those. He's probably my favorite writer. Though, um, there is a small part of me that would... That... I I always find amusing that he that Howard was friends with Lovecraft and the two of them pro probably shared a mutual hatred of Hugo. Yeah, funny thing is about Howard and Lovecraft. So I have a complete collection of their correspondence. Uh, it's a two-volume set. It's called A Means to Freedom, and it reads like a 1930s Facebook argument. <laughs> It's it's absolutely hilarious to read it because um, back then there was a lot more focus on decorum and respect. So really, it was it was it was it's like reading them like today on when people go back and forth on social media, they just tear into each other. It's a big flame war, and I hate you, and I'm just you're just gonna insult you and tear you up. And Howard and Lovecraft did the same thing, but it was always. With greatest respect, sir, you know that I, you know, deeply respect your words, but you're an asshole. Like it was, it's really, really funny to read their conversations. Yeah, I don't, rec I don't recall if, if there, if there was as much hate if, um, Howard hated, um, Hugo as much as Lovecraft did. Lovecraft outright called him Hugo the Rat. <laughs> yeah, that I'm not sure. Um, I don't recall reading much in their correspondence about Hugo. Um, so I'm not sure yeah. about that. But the other, the I think the the other thing that I that I I will admit I do f I do find interesting, and I had I had to get it's refreshing that you mentioned being a Howard purist because um I have frequent I have frequently had to be be that one guy who corrects people whenever um whenever Conan is brought up and they bring up the and they bring up the movies. And mm -hmm. the ver the proper version of Conan is vi has very little in common with that version of the movies because that version was made to work around Arnold's flaws. To a point. 
to a point, yes. Um, it also was based more on a uh, Frank Frazetta interpretation of Conan than it was actual Robert E. Howard. I always like to say that first two Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and I do include Conan the Destroyer in this because I think it's an underrated film. Um, to me, those are both really good Hyborian Age movies to be about some other guy whose name is also Conan. And, uh, and then the Jason Momoa one, I think, has a fantastic presentation of the character of Conan in an absolutely terrible presentation of the Hyborian Age. Yeah, and though, give, though given, given that, what would be, what was, given that kind of relationship, what was your take on the, on Purefoy's take on Solomon Kane? I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I think it's probably the most... And when I say faithful here, I'm talking about in spirit of the character goes, not in the story. I think that in spirit, the Solomon Cain movie was probably the most faithful Robert E. Howard adaptation we've had. Um, now, Howard, of course, never really gave Solomon Cain a clear origin story, but many of the hints that he drops in the Cain stories do jibe with the origin story that they decided to give Kane in that movie. Uh, there's one point where he says, somebody asks him what he's after in one of the stories, and he says, mayhap the salvation of my soul. Uh, there's another point where somebody asks him about his past, and he said that there was a time when he led ungodly men doing horrible deeds, though the cause was just, and his role fighting in the Crusades at the beginning of that is, maybe not the Crusades, but the, the sack of, of uh, uh, forget what town it is but it's in spain the the muslim town in spain the whole beginning of that movie fits that line perfectly so i think i think it's a shame that the marketing went so bad on that movie it could have been a bigger hit and the director wanted to do two more that were going to directly adapt the actual Kane stories and i think that would have been fantastic to see as far as marketing the the story that that i was always relayed and keep in mind, I'm only getting one side of the story, so so for the sake of fairness... Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, hang on a... S Sorry about that. Discord decided to derp on me. Um, oh, that's okay. What I was going to say is... There wa now, t now, because of the fact I'm only, I only have one side of the story on this, it's I have to, for the sake of fairness, say, say take take it with a grain of salt. But mm. I was I. But every time every time I would ask around, the response I would get was that the, the big problem was that there was a pissing match going on regarding the distribution rights. Yeah, that's exactly what it was, and I don't I don't I mean I I don't think any of us are privy to the complete details of what went on there, but it had something to do with line and the distribution issues of the of the movie. Because the version that the version that I was only able to get a hold of it by by importing a UK copy of the of the originally, yeah. I had the same thing. It's now available in the United States finally and I did get a US copy, but yeah, I also have my, my region B mm -hmm. Blu ray from the UK. Yeah. Which if, which um, of course, of course, since it, since uh, since it had to be that degree of um imported, just getting it took took an eternity and a half. Right. Right. Now, the other one of the other th what it is it is kind of funny that you that you say that that's the be that that's the best, but I'd say that's the best adaptation. But that I'd say that's more of a more of more of a case of the. The best, the best of the rest situation, like what happens, like what happens if you're in third place in a Formula One race. Um, yeah. Not third, not third place, fourth place. I should, I should clarify. But when it, when you look at the when you look at the other stuff, you have you obviously have the two Conan movies, which you already you already mentioned. Um, Cole just came off as Hercules in a different coat of paint. I actually. Um, I enjoyed Call for what it is. It's kind of a guilty pleasure of mine, um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that that movie was originally written for Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it was written to be the third Conan movie. 
uh, and it's based loosely on, you can see it if you watch it, it's loosely based on Hour of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and Arnold Schwarzenegger ended up not being available to do it. So when they hired Kevin Sorbo, he said, I'm not going to try to follow Arnold Schwarzenegger as Conan. So they rewrote it to make it a call film. Which, um, the thing, something that I found um, found amusing was that at one point they wanted to do something James Bond-ish when, when it came to Conan. Not in terms of putting Conan into the James Bond universe, although that, that, although that would be hilarious. But <laughs> rather, ma rather making it an anthology character that is played by different actors over the years. Yeah, and, and obviously he, you could do that. No one actor is Conan. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Conan, while he's iconic in his own right, is nothing like Robert E. Howard's character. And um, I would I would say a bit a bit of a problem with anyone trying to tackle Conan is is that there have been so many different takes over the years. It's a similar it's a similar issue you have with superheroes just stretched out longer because. You obviously have Howard's take. Then you have the t then you have the take that was in the Savage Sword of Conan by Buscema. Right. Right. Then you have Momoa's take, and I honestly think he got a raw deal because people kept com people kept trying to compare him to people tr kept trying to act like that film was a remake of the original when it wasn't. Oh. Right, I, I agree, and there's, there's, uh, there's that film has plenty of problems of its own, but Jason Momoa was not one of the problems. No. Then, then of course you have the run that Dark Horse and then later Dynamite had with the character, mm -hmm. and which I loved, by the way. Dark Horse's Conan run, I absolutely loved, yeah. start to finish. I know a lot of people have some issues with it, starting around when they did Queen of the Black Coast. Uh, I personally enjoyed the entire run of Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. I was not pleased when Marvel got it back, and I think my concerns were justified when Marvel immediately turned around and introduced Conan to the Savage Avengers. Um, and, and I'm glad that I'm glad that that's... I, I think somebody else has the license. Yeah, I think Marvel lost the license Marvel again. lost it, and now it's in the hands of Titan Comics, who... Yeah. It's very... It, who, um... They are loose... They are loosely associated with Funcom, who has, who has been okay. handling... The, who's been handling Conan on the video game side for years now. Right, right. But because of you, because of the fact that you have so many different interpretations, um, it's that's one of those things that any that somebody has to take into account when they're tr when they're trying to add to add to that particular tapestry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the reason I bring up superheroes in that is you kind of have a similar problem when you have this is this is an issue when you don't have something that I refer to as a series bible. Oh, which I'd like to say I came up with the term, but actually I actually I didn't. It's a term that's used that's been used in television for decades. Right, right. Where right. There is some sort of some sort of book that some sort of book document or what have you that is essentially the, essentially all of the all of the relevant material of characters, person um, personality traits, um, relationships. Story beats all in one place to keep everything consistent. Um, a lot, a lot of television shows are going to have the ones that are properly managed are going to have that to make sure that everything is consistent going forward, given all of the moving parts in involved from writers to actors. Right. Right. And it's one. It's like I'm. Earlier on, earlier on this channel, a few months back, we did a, we did a whole thing about how about how um, this there about the falsehood that people have when it comes to Superman as this Jesus metaphor, as if that's integral to the character when in actuality it isn't. And the I bring I bring that up just to, just to illustrate how different interpretations can be ret, can be retroactively seen as integral when they really aren't. Right, right. Um, I, th I think, I think for a, I think for a long time, people had this idea of of Conan having that Schwarzenegger-like bodybuilder physique. When that, I don't, th I don't think that was ever intended to be the case. 
No, it is. Howard describes him as barrel-chested and bull-necked a couple times. Yeah. He is described as a very massive man in in the original stories. Yeah. Um, but uh, I had some somewhere I wanted to well, go, and it just went out the, of my head. The reason the reason I said that is because because of the build that Momo that Momoa had, which I remember some people being very har being very harsh about and comparing that to um, Schwarzenegger. Oh right, right. Yeah, and Momoa's build worked for Conan as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he necessarily needs to look like Mr. Universe, but he is supposed to be barrel chested and you know with thick arms and a thick neck and. Um, but he also moves with the grace of a panther. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying with the different, the all the different interpretations that are out there, and each person that gets the license is in no way beholden to handle it the the same way somebody that had the license before I, handled yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I de in that in I developed an understanding about why about why um, the vice grip that Christopher Tolkien had on um, Tolkien's work was so, was so important. Because it's very tempting for a creative to want to do their own take on a concept. <laughs> Just watch the ranks of power. <laughs> um, I think I, I think I ended I think I ended up going through. I couldn't even get through. I couldn't even get through one episode of it. I only lasted about. Yeah, I only lasted about fifteen minutes before I said, "Fuck this, I'm out." Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. Um, and in in fact, <laughs> I uh, in fact I en I ended up doing a I ended up doing a being involved in a watch party of the of the theatrical trilogy as, as my own little form of protest because I I know that the purists have issues with those films but I do think whenever it comes to this sort of purism it's important to see the bigger picture and how adapting adapting a book adapting the text of a book straight into film is not something that works right right Right, and that's what, uh, and going again back to, to the Conan thing, I tell people all the time, if you're a Tolkien fan and you're complaining about the Hobbit films and the Lord of the Rings films, you should try being a Conan fan for ten minutes, and then just happy that you got such a faithful and beautifully rendered adaptation in those six movies. Or, let, let, me, let, me, um, let me twist the knife a little bit further. Imagine being a John Carter fan. Yeah, you know what? But again, I actually really enjoyed that movie. I think that movie is very faithful in spirit to Edgar, and I think that John, that A Princess of Mars, as written, is unfilmable because it would be just be really boring. It's it's the book is largely just a travelogue of Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no real main conflict. There's no real main villain, and I think the movie did a good job with the characters, except for the Therns different but it worked in the context of that movie and i think what killed that movie was historically bad marketing i mean to the point where people lost their jobs over the marketing of that movie so i think that john carter was uh faithful to the spirit of burroughs if not the letter of the story yeah. and now now shif shifting into shifting into that into wasted lands, which is very much carrying that that kind of um, approach of the age undreamed of. Yes. yes. So, I suppose I suppose the first thing first thing I should dip into is the origin story of the ogres system, especially especially given some, especially given some more recent of uh, recent events involving the world's most litigious role playing game, as I've as I've nicknamed it. Yeah. Um, I, you mean you just want to know how it how it came to be the ogre system? Yeah. Okay. So for years, I've been, uh, and I hate to use the term scholar because that implies some sort of formal study. I hate. I hate I've, to see you in robes. I, I yeah. I've I've but I've worked a lot in uh, reading and researching the history of Dungeons and Dragons, um, and I am a member of the community over at the ODD seventy four. Pro boards, message boards, who are wonderful guys, um, and we've talked for years about the origins of D and D and how it came about and where it came from and early drafts and this, that, and the other thing. And I've done a lot, and that's where actually orcs came from. Was my efforts to build, 
but I was researching how you would use chainmail combat with original Dungeons and Dragons. And I had written all these notes down, and by the time I realized what was happening, I had written half of a game. So I figured I would just finish it and throw it out there, and that became Spellcraft and Swordplay. So flash forward years later, I have I had an irregular blog, which I still do, called the Wasted Lands Fantasy Blog. Um, and I would write a bunch of different exegesis articles on D&D and how you can use o original Dungeons & Dragons for different things. I had written a blog on how you would use OD&D, the three little brown books, to run a Buffy the Vampire Slayer game. Mm -hmm. um, after I published that blog, the next day, Tim Brannon, who's a good friend of mine, we worked together for, with Eden Studios back in the day. I've written a couple source books for All Flesh Must Be Eaten. Uh, he wrote Ghosts of Albion, co-wrote it. Um, we worked together uh, on some stuff for Buffy and which Armageddon and all you know our, our DNA really together grew up working for Eden Studios back in the early 2000s um, so Tim messages me out of the blue after I had written this blog and he said dude why are we not writing this as a game we have to write this as a game nobody could write this like we can at the time I was really busy with stuff for Troll Lord Games because I'm a staff writer for them and with some freelance stuff that I was doing for Goodman Games and a couple other companies and I said, look, dude, I just don't have the time to get into a major project like that. But Tim is canny, and he knew that by saying that, he was going to put a worm in my ear. <laughs> and two weeks later, I had the system two-thirds fleshed out. So I messaged him back. I said, all right, let's 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 give this a go. But if we're going to do it, I'm going to formal like Because Elflare Games at the time was just kind of a name I was using to publish Spellcraft and Swordplay. Um and I think chutzpah I did before the ogre system too. Um, but uh, I said, well, we're going to formalize Elflare Games. I'm going to make it an LLC. We're going to do this properly. We're going to get a, do an offset. We're going to kickstart it, offset printing, the whole nine yards. And he said, great, let's do that. Uh, so that's really, that was the germination of the ogre's system. As far as the three mechanics in it, really is kind of an effort to demystify how older versions of D&D always worked. People have this conception that older versions of D&D are very arcane and complicated and difficult to understand, and they're not if you explain them and codify them properly. I, it's funny you mentioned that. So that's that. how Ogres started. It's funny you mentioned that because... Um, as far as the litigious <laughs> nature of those wizards that live up on the coast, mm -hmm. um, when all the stuff happened in January with the OGL, yep. uh, like everybody else, I was like, crap, they're trying to put my company out of business. Like, they're legit trying to drive me out of business. They want to stomp me out because they know I can't fight back because I'm, I'm a one-man operation. Because um, Tim is not formally a member of Elflare Games. Now, that being said, his DNA is all over the stuff and his opinions always count he's playtesting lands right now uh him and derek stolting who was another guy who uh we worked with at eden studios they're my two uh they're the voices in my ear basically they're my two advisors um and when the day comes that i can grow the company they will be the first two i bring on board as partners um but going back to that so when when watsy did this whole thing about the OGL and they were going to cancel the OGL and immediately everybody was talking about what are we going to do where are we going to find another open license and um, along with several other publishers uh, I was one of the ones that that came up and, and publicly said uh, sorry for that ding dong somebody just came in the house my wife just came in the house uh, my uh, I publicly said well, you know what we're just going to dump the OGL all together um, and we can still have the same game we don't need anybody else's open game license we can keep going on as we always have been with just some minor terminology changes to the game because you can't copyright a rules system you can only copyright the expression of the rules system mm -hmm. um, now you do have to be careful because there's some gray areas in there that can open you up to litigation but so I kind of went all in on let's 
redo all the terminology in Night and so we changed all the attributes, but they're still recognizable. So my attributes now are uh, intel. Just, excuse me, uh, strength, agility, toughness, intelligence, wits, and persona, mm -hmm. which is the same six attributes, just renamed. Um, I use defense value for defense. I use vitality and vitality dice for you know life points, hit points. Um, and I rewrote every spell in the game, top to bottom. We rewrote every single spell. Um, and along with a couple other very minor per, uh, shifts, uh, there's a new alignment system in it. We changed the alignment system. Um, we were pretty easily, I mean, it was grunt work, but we were pretty easily able to remove the open game content from Night Shift without sort of harm to the game whatsoever and it's still exactly the same game it still exactly plays exactly the same way yeah and um, what I a few things I do find amusing when it came to the demystifying thing um, I remember years ago I said I said Thaco Thaco is not a is not a impossible concept to understand it's just explained poorly and yeah, it's basic subtraction instead of basic addi addition, and I think that throws a lot of people off. What's funny is a lot of people tell us that the way combat works in Night Shift and now Wasted Lands uh, is we made Thacko make sense, which wasn't what we set out to do, but it, it did, I can't deny that it did kind of come out that way, because instead of having to do subtraction, ours is you're at, we still use low armor classes better. So what you're doing is you're adding your, your D20 plus your attack bonuses plus your opponent's armor class and trying to get 20 or better. Yeah, and the f I think the I think what ends up making it easier to work with is that for the longest for the longest there's a concept I've talked about over the years that I call that I call the Rome effect. Not that it has anything to do with Ro with Rome, but rather the adage "all roads lead to Rome." And if you look mm -hmm. at a lot of different games, there's always one mechanic that everything else springs from. In in something like in something like say, um, powered by the apocalypse, it's always two it's always two d six, and you're comparing it against some a set group of thresholds. And right. in something like fate, you're roll you're always rolling four fudge dice, and and looking at how many net to, net pluses you ended up getting in right right in something in something and in something like world of darkness you're always rolling a set of d t a set of d10s and looking for hits in right. shadowrun you're looking for how many uh, a few pounds of d6s and you're looking for a number of hits right and by having it that ev that a rule of 20 applies you have that roam that people can um, build around well, it's interesting that you say that. They're thinking about games, all games that have a unified task resolution mechanic, and at its default, the Ogre system actually has three mechanics for resolving tasks, not one. Um, now we do have guidelines in, uh, particularly in Wasted Lands, but they're also in the in the Night Companion for Night Shift. We have guidelines for converting the game to. A unified mechanic if you want to do it that way but our three mechanics are the first one is the attribute check mechanic and combat mechanic which is the d21 that I just explained uh, the second one is your your uh, class skills mechanic class abilities and skills if you choose to use skills mechanic and that's a straight percentile roll uh, and you adjust your base percentage up and down in increments of five or ten percent based on the, the difficulty of the task um, and the third one is just for the GM, and that's the rule of two. The rule of two came from the earliest versions of D and D and gaming, where in if you remember in the old AD and D book, if you're an elf, you would notice a secret door on a roll of one or two on a D six. Uh, if you weren't a thief and you tried to listen at a door, you would hear noise on a one or two on a D six. That's the rule of two. If the GM needs to adjudicate some issue that's not otherwise covered in the rules. Or they want a backup roll for something, they pick a die based on how likely they think it might be, throw it, and look for a one or two. So those are the three mechanics 
that by their default power the ogre's system. Now the reason we did three mechanics, uh, aside from the game's DNA in, in old school gaming, is that there's an elegance there in knowing, based on what somebody's rolling at the table, what's going on in the game. Um, it's a way to keep your, your game moving fast without everybody at the table going, wait a second, he's making a roll, can I make a roll too? Or wait a second, can I try what she's trying? Or if they're rolling percentile dice, you know that they're rolling something that's very specifically related to their character. Mm -hmm. If they're rolling a d20, you know it's an attribute check or a combat check. So there's kind of an elegance there that, that has borne out in, in extensive playtesting that actually speeds the game along and keeps things very intuitive. Yeah. Now, when it when it comes to the 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 fallout from the from the OGL thing, um, I do I do recall in the aftermath of that of that going down, and I ended up covering this that notion that you that you guys are doing of just divesting yourself from all, from all of the terminology that was in the OGL. That is something I was seeing a lot of people doing, and it's something I think a lot of people because they're so focused on the on the main company and their massive screw up weren't commenting on cuz yeah obviously Pathfinder is do, is doing a whole doing a whole revision to their to their core material that's also going to be uh, reflected in Archives of Nethys their their official wiki right right um you ha you had the you also had the rise of of the orc license that Pathfinder and Chaosium and a bunch of others are involved with you ha yeah. you have pl you have plenty of folk who who just decided you know what screw it we'll make our own open license with blackjack and hookers <laughs> yeah and it was one it was one of those things i had predicted because when i looked at what when i looked at what was happening the the vibe that i ended up getting was the management there was akin, was akin to Vince McMahon in the first incarnation of the XFL where it was very clear that he it was very clear he did not fully understand football culture and it was yeah. very clear that the that the people making these decisions didn't understand the culture of the tabletop scene and if I, if I have to and if you need a perfect case in point with this it is their virtual tabletop which was was already something I was iffy with because there's already because the virtual tabletop scene is already pretty full as it is, oh, right, pretty full and v full of very feature-rich um, platforms. But when I found out that they were going to be using not only the Unreal Engine, but also they wanted to put it on piece on um, consoles, I ended up busting out laughing because those are two really really bad decisions. Yeah, because. There's a reason why um, why RTSs usually do not succeed on consoles. That is ve the same thing goes with like 4X games. You're, you're most people who are going to be playing something like Civilization are not going to be playing it on a console. They're going to be playing it on PC. Right. right. See now, I really can't speak with any authority on this issue at all because I generally don't play games. I am, I am, and I don't begrudge anybody that does. I want to make that very clear. I think there's definitely a big space and role for VTTs in our industry, and I think that they've done things for people who are unable to find a local group and who want to play with friends from all over the world. It's a wonderful thing. I just personally don't get a lot out of playing that way. Uh, I don't really enjoy it. Um, yeah. So I can't. I, I, I just really can't speak with a lot of authority as to that end of the spectrum. Though I will say we are working on ogres on Defoundry right now. Yeah, and the I'm I mostly bring the, bring up this kind of thing because it's sh again it showed a it showed a it showed a complete misunderstanding of the of the over of the overall scene because. Mo because e even with even with that, most pe most people who are going to be playing virtual tabletop are likely going to be playing it on a on a PC or a laptop, not right, not right. on not on a dedicated gaming console. They're not you're not going to see somebody pick somebody if somebody wanted to play 
some play D and D on a on a P, on a PS4 or something like that, they would be they'd be far more likely to load up a a um a fantasy vid, a fantasy video game. Yeah, I can see that argument very much. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't a modern console. Uh, I, I have a I have a stand up arcade machine <laughs> in my living room, um, but uh, so I'm not sure worlds are like or what the infrastructure is like on the PS4 and 5 these days. If I mean, they I know they have servers. Do they have keyboards? Do they have? I mean, I can see if they have the peripherals and the interface how it could feasibly work. But by the same token, I can see what you're saying as well. People who get on the PS4 aren't getting on it to play the kind of games that you play on on a laptop or a desktop. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, spo- I suppose another ex- another example I could, I could use is how there there were there were pl- there have been plenty of attempts to do to to do um for for up until Halo any attempt to do a first-person shooter on consoles ended ended up failing, or or okay. were, or were just significantly less successful. And the big right. reason for that is a lot when it comes to your when it comes to your quakes or your unreals or the like. You have fast movement and precise weapons with a with a setup that isn't going to isn't going to be all that compatible when when, it, right. when you're dealing with a controller. It's not going to be as precise as a mouse. And you can hook, because everything is with USBs these days, you can hook up a keyboard, but it's, but with the way people have consoles set up, um, that's that's not, that's not going to happen nearly as much. Because right. in the, in in like the late 90s and the early, and the early 2000s, there were console, there were, um, like keyboard and mouse add-ons, but they barely got used. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of- it's astonishing. It's astonishing to me that the gaming industry hasn't really figured that out yet. Why there's still this strange split? But that's probably a discussion that we could go for hours on a completely different topic. I can, I can say, I can say that it that it mostly comes down to logistics. Yeah. But. When it now, when it comes to when it comes to um when it comes to wasted lands, um yeah. One of one of the things I one of the things I was I was curious about is in reg, is in regard to how you how you transfer over the some some of the same setups that you had from night sh- from night shift over into this because obviously you're dealing with two completely different genres. Sure, sure. And Wasted Lands is actually going to be the second. Well, it's it planned to be the second of a trilogy of use the ogre system, um, whereas Night Shift gives you all you need, all the tools you need to do modern gaming. Now it has a focus on urban fantasy and horror, mm-hmm. but you could play a dark superheroes game with Night Shift if you wanted to. Wasted Lands actually brings in some mechanics that make that even more possible. Um, but then Wasted Lands is going to be our fantasy setting. Um, and then we're planning on, hopefully, knock on wood, but don't quote me on this because I don't want people to say it's vaporware. Hopefully next year sometime we want to get out 12 Parsecs Adventures Beyond the Solar Frontier, which is going to be our sci-fi version. So we will have a fantasy, a modern, and a sci-fi game, all using the Ogre's system that you can use to go back and forth. Um, but what specific questions did you have about transferring? Because the rules are the rules. Yeah. I mean, they transfer pretty seamlessly. Um, I think I think the big one would be would be making cl- would be making class designs that fit within both within both the setting that within the kind of I I won't say setting, but the kind of the kind of subgenre you guys are going for, while also fitting right. within the rule set of ogres. So. so um, is actually where Tim is extremely helpful because when we're coming up with experience charts, he has a PH statistics. So <laughs> pretty much every character class I make, I send it to him and go, "Hey, run a statistical analysis on this against all of the other character classes." And he gets back to me and says, "This XP progression is good, or it needs tweaked this way, or it needs tweaked that way," um, which is very helpful to me because I am terrible at at math. 
Uh, so it's really good to have my corner for those issues. Um, but uh, class design is it's kind of an art um, as well as a science. You just have to know what role you want the class to fulfill in the overall context of your game and then work it out. Like what, what would this class... I'll, I'll give you an example. The biggest... Excuse me. The biggest new class we have in Wasted Lands is the Archer. Um, we did import from Night Shift. We imported the Theosophist, which is renamed the Necromancer, uh, the Psychic. Um, the Survivor became the Renegade. Um, and what else am I thinking? I gotta pull up my classes here. Um, give me one second, because I don't want to forget something. Um, the the veteran and parts of the chosen one kind of went together to make the warrior mm -hmm. class. Um, so the warrior is kind of like the veteran, but has a few extra neat tweaks. Like something I always thought, uh, I've always wrestled with the fighter character class in various versions of fantasy gaming because you have a, an inherent problem where by 6th, 7th level spellcasters outclass fighters. Spellcasters make this qualm being one of the weakest characters to the game in the game to one of the most powerful. And in, in, in AD 1st edition there's a spell called Force Cage that has no saving throw. You can kill somebody by dropping a Force Cage on them and leaving them there to starve to death. Um, so what I did was I, I kind of wanted to make the warrior a class, and I, I kind of took this back to, again, to Conan. Um, if you've ever read the story People of the Black Circle, um, Conan, at one point in the story, he knows he's going up against this circle of dark magicians, uh, and he gets a girdle that basically renders him immune to their magic. Um, and I wanted to make fighters scary two mages no matter what level you're at so our warrior class has a small not huge but a small degree of spell resistance mm -hmm. that increases as they go up in levels uh, and they also have a class ability where if they miss in combat they can make a percentile roll to still do minimal damage to their target mm -hmm. um, so the warrior was kind of shifted in that way right over the sage straight over from night shift uh, so the Necromancer, the Psychic, the Renegade, the Sage, and the Sorcerer all drop in seamlessly from Night Shift into Wasted Lands. The Warrior was tweaked and, and given a bit of an overhaul. And then we have the Archer, which is a brand new character class, uh, which we actually have a free preview of on the Kickstarter page right now, so people can take a look at it. Um, and I just I chose the classes that work best as fantasy archetypes for a game that was intended to be I mean, if I'm going to be honest, a D&D &D alternative for somebody that's looking f to change things up a little bit at their table yeah. or expand their existing approach to gaming, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying if you love D&D, &D, that's great. Keep D&D. But my game will also bring something new to the table that might make you look at things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's in the way the rules are handled and, and in the approach to classes and things yeah. like that. So, And the... Well my, well, my crusade has always been get, giving people as many options as possible when it comes to their fantasy gaming. I don't, I never want a, I never want a literal all roads lead to Rome situation. Right. Um, so it, it definitely sounds like a lot, like for a lot of the classes when it comes to when it comes to wasted lands, it was, it was, mo it was a good chunk of it was just reskinning what you already had, but were were. Was there was there any one case where there was an attempt at reskinning what you had, but it but it didn't quite fit for one reason or another, and had to be a bit more had to be a bit more in depth in its design? I would say the war. Um, the original idea was just to bring the the veteran in from night shift, uh, and it, it was it would work. Uh, didn't quite get there, so we ended up making the the overhaul of it that became the warrior in wasted lands yeah and it is funny you mention the the that particular issue when it comes to uh, when it comes to bringing in 
um, warrior the warrior archetype in fantasy games because the the argument I've always made as far as why that why there seems to be a problem with that archetype in fantasy games is warrior itself and or or fighter or whatever you want to call it on paper is weight the idea of somebody who's good with weapons is way 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 too broad yeah yeah oh that and the whole you can equip any weapon that doesn't have the same level of impact when people are going to stick to a certain way they equip their character um for the most part Right, and we one of the ways we address that, and this is something, this is a concept that might be alien to a lot of younger gamers, a lot of get newer gamers. Um, every attack in Wasted Lands and in o in the Ogre system, by default, every attack does one d6 damage. It doesn't matter if you're using a two-handed bastard sword, or if you're using a rapier, or if you're using a dagger, or if you're using your fist. Every attack does one d6 damage. The idea is that combat is abstracted, and Somebody who is trained with a dagger is going to be just as somebody who is swinging a great axe in their own way because they know how to use that weapon. So everything does. Now we do have, for people who that that's a little too much of a step, we have optional rules for variable weapon damage mm -hmm. in the game. But um, yeah, by default all of the weapons do 1d6 and we handle additional damage in, in the form where sometimes you'll roll extra dice and total them more often you'll get uh like the warrior has an increased damage ability where for every attack they roll 2d6 and keep the better of the two mm -hmm. so that's how we handle like the warrior is better at fighting than the sorcerer you know um we do a lot of a lot of though you'll hear me say a lot of we also have this in there um we have a whole appendix on optional rules that lets you completely customize the mechanics of the game to be exactly the type of game that you want to play at your table. Which, that is, that is definitely appreciated because um, every t every table should be di should be different in, in some form. Um, yeah. The, I, I often I often, I often say when it comes to this, look at um, Uno. When's the last time you saw anyone playing Uno as written? Right, everybody's got their house rules. Yeah. Well, there there was a version of Uno that came, that came out a decade ago that was full of a bunch of submitted house rules. Right. Right. So even the people who even the people who make the game know know this. And Right. The and in oh, just not too long ago I was playing a version of Uno that was essentially giant Uno where all the cards were freaking huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My my say freaking huge. I'd I'd say they're about about the each individual card was is about the, was about the length of from your elbow to the t to the tip of your fingers. Nice, <laughs> nice. nice. And one of and one of the rules one of the rules we had was um, instead of re instead of reverse car instead of the reverse card working the way it does, what it does is um, everybody hands their hand to the to the player to their left. Mm -hmm. So. You could have some. You could have somebody who's got one card. They've declared Uno. Then somebody plays Reverse, and now they've got eight. <laughs> right. 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 Which. Yeah, yeah but it, yeah, it is. It's very much like that. Um, we we have the options in here, to. Um, now again, I I mentioned earlier we have the three mechanics. The the first two obvious options are you can convert your game, either to all D twenty rollover or either to all percentile dice. But we also have guidelines in changing the whole game to a dice pool system if you want if you want to throw a fistful of dice and look for hits the guidelines of the whole game are in there to do that and the best thing is none of it requires you to change the character sheet in any way whatsoever they all work with the same character sheet um, and we have rules for ditching class and level and going with point based characters um, that does shift by its very nature it shifts the power balance of the game uh, when you're building characters but it's there if you want to if you want to change the game over if you don't like class and level you can do you can do wasted lands or night shift uh, as a point by character generation dice pool system 
and the character sheets will still look exactly the same as the character sheets for somebody that's doing it with the class and level and the three mechanics. Which is is certainly is certainly nice because um, we all know we all know that one group of people who are who are um, goblins and want to roll all the damn dice. <laughs> um, some of us have been that person. Yeah, I know some people might deny it, but you cannot lie to me about th about this. Everybody has a bit of dice goblin in them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. There was in the old Cortex uh, core rulebook, the generic Cortex core rulebook that Jamie Chambers wrote, uh, and I forget who wrote the introduction to it, but it was one of the guys that developed the system. He said there's just something satisfying about feeling a bunch of dice clack in your hand before you roll them on the table. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely an appeal to dice pool systems. Yeah. And I've I've made memes about the pounds of dice in sh in Shadowrun games because well, as much of a as much of a running joke as that is, jokes like that always have some basis in reality. Mm hmm And plus there, plus there's been there's there's been there's been cases where I where I had to institute the rule of if there's more than if there's more than ten die rolled, um. You're go then you're going to have you're going to have to assume some of them are are rolled at their av are rolled at their average because we're not sit we're not sitting here watching you roll thirty dice. <laughs> right, right. Like, I can be I can be as much of a do dice goblin as anybody else, but um, sanity has to prevail eventually. Right, exactly. Yeah. So with that in with that in mi with that in mind. Um, now you you are making t you are making two books when it comes to wasted lands. The first being obviously the ro the role playing game itself, the rule and the rules therein. The other is what you're referring to as the Gazetteer of the Dreaming Age, as well as the campaign guide. Correct. Yeah. Now I'm guessing that I'm guessing that is primarily going to contain the going to contain your setting of wasted lands. Exactly. It's it's well. It's it's the GM's guide and the setting guide. So there's actually a lot in there for players as well as the GM. But it has uh, a big chapter on playing in and running a game set in the Dreaming Age campaign setting. Um, it's got the bestiary is in that book. Uh, the bestiary has somewhere around 55 creatures. I don't I don't remember the exact number, but it's somewhere around 55 creatures in the bestiary. Someday in the future, we want to do a full book that's just going to be an ogre's bestiary, but that's down the road a piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have an overview of the Wasted Lands, which we released as a free preview on the website, or on the Kickstarter campaign. Uh, so people can go over there and read Chapter 8, which is an overview of the Dreaming Age. Uh, chapter 9 discusses the peoples of the Dreaming Age, so the different creatures that you're one in, one interesting thing is if you play in the dreaming age campaign setting it's set 65 million years ago uh not long after the kt extinction event which wiped out the dinosaurs mm -hmm. in this setting it also shifted the earth's orbit made the stars go wrong and that's what sent the great old ones into their eternal slumber mm -hmm. um and the characters that you're playing are not homo sapiens obviously because homo sapiens didn't exist 65 million years ago what you are playing are proto-humans who are intelligent bipedal creatures all with the same stats but evolved from different animals as the result of the great old ones experimentations the great old ones are presented as tinkerers who just experiment for the sake of experimentation and then cast aside their they either use or cast aside their experiments so humans that you're playing you could be playing uh, a, a human that's evolved from an avian species. You could be playing a human that's evolved from a reptilian or an insect, or if you want to play someone that looks like a modern human, you would just say that you were evolved from a simian uh, creature. But so that, that that's that's kind of the shtick there. And the chapter nine kind of discusses that, and it discusses all the species that are still left behind after the old ones go away, like Deep Ones and Serpent Men and Scorpion Men and all these other uh, Mygo and Elder Things and all of those uh, Lovecraft yeah. baddies. Um, chapter 10, then, is a gazetteer of the Dreaming Age that goes over every single kingdom mm -hmm. and region in the world. 
Um, I have uh, a woman, uh, Meliora Henning, who is an outstanding artist, and uh, I think she's going to be a star in the gaming industry. Um, she's working on my world map right now, and I can't wait till she gets it done so people can see it because uh, it's going to be really cool. Um, but I think really what sets the waste the, the the Dreaming Age campaign setting apart from anything else is that while you can very much play it as a traditional Robert E. Howard style swords and sorcery game, uh, the shtick of it is that your character might be named Quetzalcoatl or Ogun or uh, Zar Zarathustra or not Zarathustra it would be uh, oh, uh, uh, Ariman or Ormazd. Um, Ahura Mazda is what I was trying to think. Zarathustra is a prophet. But you get the idea. Thor, Odin, Zeus. You are playing a proto-human being who whose exploits will be remembered in millions of years through ancestral memory as the exploits of the gods of myth. Um, and you pick up, as you go along and as you meaningfully interact with mythologies, uh, and archetypal mythological stories of different types, you pick up what are called divine touchstones. And divine touchstones are special abilities that can take almost any form. The GM is given a great deal of freedom to work them up and customize them to the individual character. Uh, but they kind of represent your quote-unquote godly powers. Even though you never actually become a god, you're always you just, this is your you're, you're gaining these powers from from the earth itself. Because uh, the Earth is waking up after the old ones went away, and uh, there's two types of energy that you encounter, which is the bleeding, which is the energies of the deeper dark from the great old ones, and there's the radiance, which is the energy that comes from the Earth itself. And the divine touchstones ostensibly come from the radiance. Um, so if you're playing Thor, for example, uh, and I always default to Thor because he's really the easiest to talk about in this sense. If you're playing Thor, for example, the first divine touchstone you might get could be Mjolnir, and it's a hammer that deals, you know, it gives you an extra bonus to hit and damage and maybe returns to you when it's thrown. Um, and then when you get to, say, 6th level as Thor, you gain the ability to cast Lightning Bolt once a day because, you know, you're, you're building these abilities as a storm an archetype of you know storms and mm -hmm. and whatnot so that's kind of the idea behind the wasted lands campaign setting the waste the dreaming age campaign setting is that you're playing the birth of the gods of old who through the greatest game of telephone in history their exploits are going to be twisted and misremembered through ancestral memory down through the ages as the stories of the gods of our mythology and given that within within the book, do you plan on putting um, some guidance for GMs to create to create new touchstones? Absolutely, yes. So there is a list in there of examples of ten examples for each character level. So if character level is one to ten, there's so there's a hundred examples of divine touchstones in the book as it stands. And then GMs are given some guidelines advice on how to take what's there and adapt it and change it or even invent entirely new divine touchstones to suit the specific individual characters that are getting them. Mm -hmm. So every character no two characters should have the same set of divine touchstones as they as they which is good because the way divine touchstone is descri is described um that is that is going to be a very a, a very character specific affair. So yeah it and even even if you put in a even if you put in the biggest list possible, eventually, a, a particular character arc would come along that doesn't quite fit. So right. having having the and obviously a GM is get, will be able to house rule it anyways. But the at the very least, what can be done as designers is make that job a little easier because. Right. And some of the examples are already set up for customization. Like, for example, um, one of the first level divine touchstones is you gain the ability to use a first level, a single first level spell as a spell like ability once a day. Well, there's a few dozen first level spells. So, right there, you're expanding your first level divine touchstones by a few dozen options. Um, 
so a lot of it it's like that it's things that you can customize and then like i said it could be that your your character gets a specific item that their the deity is known for in history and that item grants them some of the powers they get you know so yeah it's very wide open but there's very concrete examples there to help you design the the touchstones that you need for your campaign yeah now with and I, I will say I will say that divine touchstones are in volume one they're in the role-playing game and they can be ignored if you just want to run you know a standard RPG game but as as part of the rules system of the game they are in one they're one, probably one of the few instances of a rule system or subsystem that is tied to the campaign setting but is in the core rule book. Yeah. Now given given that one setting question I'd I'd want to ask is how is what people are drawing upon when they utilize magic given what given what you've described. Yeah, so magic in general magic is drawn from the bleeding. It's 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 from the deeper dark because the knowledge that humankind has of magic or proto-humanity I should say has of ma magic comes from the great old ones it comes everything that that proto-humanity has and knows comes from the great old ones and the game is kind of a, about throwing off your bonds and and taking the world for yourself so it's a gradual journey there is a discussion in the in the campaign setting book about turning areas of bleeding into areas of radiance through great deeds um so eventually uh and we don't cover this in detail in the in the core book it might be covered in a source book eventually the idea is that maybe your magic might come from radiance but for now it's coming from the bleeding and you will get corrupted if you are too reckless with magic there's a corruption mechanic where you build up points of degeneracy and those points of degeneracy translate into levels of corruption which gradually eat away at your alignment and then start creating negative physical effects given on you like effects of, of corruption yeah given that is there the possibility that there might be so it's very it's very sword and sorcery yeah. style conan style magic where magic is an alien force that corrupts its user now given that um are there are there area are there could there be potential areas within the setting where a degree of corruption is seen and the effects therein? What do you mean? Seen? What do you mean seen? I mean I mean a I mean a re a region that is more cor that is more corrupt than others. Oh yeah. I mean there are absolutely um excuse me there are absolutely sites of bleeding. Excuse me, I'm sorry. There are absolutely sites of bleeding and sites of radiance uh, that you'll encounter throughout the world. Um, and the sites of bleeding tend to be uh, the the darkest places, uh, fetid swamps, um, places where horrible performed. Um, a lot of the underworld is loaded up with the bleeding, energy from the bleeding. Um, now, places like uh, which we call, because of the way our world map is structured, we call North America and South America the Eastern continents instead of the Western continents, um, because the cradle of civilization is in Europe and the Middle East, essentially. Um, but North America specifically was a place where the old ones hadn't done a lot, so there's more radiance to be found in North America. Um, also in Hyperborea, which is our proto-Norse type area, um, is a little bit removed, and they have developed a very honest and honorable, if sometimes brutal, society. So they've driven a lot of the a lot of the bleeding away from Hyperborea, and it's more radiance there. So yes, there's places. In, to, to answer your question briefly after all that yes there's places that are very much sites of the bleeding and places that are very much sites of radiance and the campaign setting talks about some of those spots mm -hmm. now with that in mind what would what would be what would you be shooting for as far as the combined page count for both books 
They're both going to be, I think, around 208 pages or so each. So it'll be a little over 400 pages for the whole thing, which is actually why it was originally going to be in one book. Um, but if I shift, you know that we use an unusual size. Our books are seven and a quarter by nine and a quarter. Um, for over 400 pages at that size would have just been unwieldy to use at the table. So we decided we were going to have to split split it into two books. And that worked anyways because it lets us present the role-playing game unadulterated for if you don't want to use the Dreaming Age, here's your fantasy role-playing game rules that you can use to play any setting you want that you can imagine. So... And that that's all, that's always going to be appreciated, you know, because again, ha again, it's important to have uh, have options. Right. But right. With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple, and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It was a good talk. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. And you know what? I just want to say before we go out, I still have about 11 days left when we're recording this on my Kickstarter. So this comes out before the Kickstarter ends. Please head over there. Uh, check it out. We really could use the support on it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just I hope everybody really likes what they see, and I hope you guys will get behind me and support a small publisher because... million dollar kickstarters that don't need to be using kickstarter yeah. to make king every dollar you put into a little guy like me matters to me very much um and it's not just me there's a lot of small publishers out there trying to use kickstarter for what it was intended to be used for and your dollars mean a lot more to us than it does to a big company who is making hundreds of thousands of dollars in their first three hours and i've well, when it comes to when it comes to small publishers, that kind of thing I've been I've been covering in one form or another for the last five years. On the on the right, and, and that's very much appreciated. And I, I will be putting a link to the Kickstarter in the description of this video. Great, Great. thank you. Uh, but of course, of course, a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here, and. There will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>